Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Oddscast, presented by BetDSI. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC Fight Night 129 event, which takes place in Santiago, Chile. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our last event, we won one unit for UFC 224 after going 1-0 on our free bet on... The James Bochnovic versus Marcus Perez won't go the distance prop at minus 200 odds. Back to the present, UFC Fight Night 129 features a 13 fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass, Fox Sports 2, and Fox Sports 1 this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking things off on Fight Pass is a lightweight contest between Claudio Puelas, who is 8 and 2, and Felipe Silva, who is 8 and 1. Now, Nick. Where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Silva opened minus 300, the comeback on Polis at plus 220. Right now, looking over to sponsored sportsbook, betdsi.eu. Currently at betdsi, they have Silva minus 320, the comeback on Polis is at plus 250. So line margins have tightened up. It didn't really shift all that much. I mean, across the market, looking at the down best screen, it's about three to one still out there. So it looked like the opener was pretty solid, and there is going to be two-way action coming in on this fight overall. I think it's about right. Maybe a tad bit high because I think Polis has um, more upside to him potentially. Uh, he's very young, obviously. He's, I uh, believe, 22 years old right now too. So he's a very talented fighter for the age of 22. Obviously, he made it to the Ultimate Fighter um, finale. He was, you know, in the final fight, so that he lost to Bravo there. Um, he ended up getting knocked out in that fight, but still to make it to that point, I mean, that's a, a great experience to go through the ultimate fighter show and uh, having that much success on there says a lot as well. So Polis is a pretty well-rounded fighter. He's got some striking ability. He's got a little bit of power on the feet. He mixes things up fairly well. Um, defensively, you know, he could definitely improve a little bit. Um, and I think at, at times when somebody's being aggressive with him, uh, he tends to kind of, be a little bit timid and, and he needs to, uh, I think, be, get around that a little bit, be more aggressive and not be, I don't want to say scared, not fight as scared, but you know, he, again, he's a little bit more timid at times when somebody is aggressive with him. But that being said, he does have a pretty solid ground game. His wrestling's okay, but it needs some work as well. So he just needs to continue to improve his game. And I think he will do that. Again, at age 22, there is more upside for Polis. So it's going to be a, a difficult fight at times for Silva, but I've been a little bit more impressed with Silva overall. I think he's a pretty solid striker. He's got, obviously, that's where it's at with Silva. Um, you know, he's a striking striker at heart. He has decent takedown defense overall. Now, of course, for him coming off that devastating knockout loss, I mean, Tysonoff just floored him. I was surprised, honestly. I thought that was going to be a good fight. I was expecting Silva to do really well there, but Tysonoff, get him credit. I mean, he just blasted him and, and put his lights out. So that is a little bit of concern because Silva hasn't fought since then. And that's the first time in his career that he's been knocked out. I don't think Polis has the kind of power, obviously, that Tysonoff has. So I, I think I expect Silva to fare better here in the striking exchange. But that defense was definitely something to be a little bit concerned about, especially if he's a three to one favorite and you're going to lay the chalk on him. I mean, so take that for what it is. But overall, what I think is going to happen here, I think Silva is the more talented and more devastating striker on the feet. I think he's got more knockout potential here. I think that, uh, again, if Polis tries to get this fight to the floor, he's not going to have that much success. And I think Silva's going to be delivering the harder blows, the harder punishment along the way, and I, I could probably see Silva finishing Polis possibly um, before it goes to the scorecards or whatnot as well. So I am going to pick Silva. I think he's a rightful favorite in this spot, um, but again, I am a little bit concerned with what he showed against Tysonoff with that defense lacking a little bit and him getting his lights turned out, but I don't think Polis is the guy to kind of replicate that performance, though. So Polis is just a little bit too raw at this point still to get this W, in my opinion, and I think Silva is going to come away with the win, so I'm going to pick him to win. Yeah, Puelis is a talented fighter, and clearly his path to victory in this fight is to get it to the floor and look for submissions. Um, he has half of his career victories by submission, so uh, if he's going to beat Silva, then I think it's going to be on the ground. That being said, Silva is a 
very savvy kickboxer. And while obviously the last fight didn't go well for him against Tysimov, I think he's clearly better than he showed. And he's not fighting somebody like Tysimov this time around. Tysimov is an explosive power puncher, and that's really not Polis' style. I mean, Polis does have a bit of striking ability, but I think Silva is uh, a more aggressive style striker with more power. Uh, Puelas could catch Silva because, as Nick mentioned, the defense is a big question mark. And Puelas could win this fight because he's young and still improving, but we haven't seen him in a while. Um, Silva, at least, you know, we saw him earn his victory to the UFC, and then he had a very impressive performance against a fellow striker in Shane Campbell in his debut. So we know that he's capable of having some good performances. It's just he's also capable of getting blown out. So uh, I think... Puelas does not have the striking to hang with Silva, but Silva might not be able to hang with Puelas on the ground. So it's going to depend on where this fight takes place and who can uh, have control of uh, where the fight goes. So if Silva can stuff a takedown or two, I think he's going to be in really good shape. And I think that's probably what happens here. I think that he's going to be a little too savvy uh, with that veteran kickboxing ability for Puelas. But again, if Puelas gets to the floor... This gets interesting in a hurry, but my pick is going to be Felipe Silva. Now dropping down to the Bantamweight division, we have Henry Briones, who is 19-7-1, taking on Frankie Sainz, who is 12-5. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Sainz opens minus 265, Briones opens plus 185. Right now over at Bet DSI, it's currently minus 290 for Sainz. The comeback on Briones is at plus 235. So a little bit more action coming in Sainz's way. I'm not really that shocked. It doesn't seem like Briones gets a ton of respect from the MMA betting community or just the MMA community in general. I think he deserves a little bit more respect. I mean, he's a pretty solid, savvy vet that's been around the sport for a long time, and I think he's progressed his ability in his game a, a whole lot really throughout i mean making it to the ultimate fighter and getting that experience in general um and then you know i think he's performed relatively well in the ufc thus far as well i know he's suffering um back to back to back losses so three in a row for him um coming into this fight but i think if you look at his losses they're not really that bad i mean he lost to the former champ garbrandt and he actually fought garbrandt pretty well in that fight so you see the potential is there i just think it's a little bit too late for him i think his Chin is getting a little bit worse. Father Time's just kind of catching up to him, especially with all the wear and tear he's had throughout his whole career. Now, remember, most of his career took place outside of the UFC, so he's been around a while and, you know, like I said, a savvy vet. So you got to respect it. I think his stand-up game here against Saints um, could definitely be some success. I think he can give Saints some fits because I think Briones is boxing and he's a threat on the feet as far as power goes as well. And Saints is susceptible to getting blasted and rocked at times. We've seen that in the past as well. But Saints, to me, overall still is a little bit better. He's a little bit more well-rounded. Obviously, he has a wrestling background, so he's going to have an advantage there. I think his boxing is nothing to uh, take lightly either. Saints has some power in his own right. Uh, he's got good accuracy and timing with it. So I think this is kind of going to be a back-and-forth war somewhat, but I think Sainz is going to be the one that kind of controls the pace, controls the tempo with his wrestling, and I trust his chin just a little bit more um, right now than I do Briones. So I'm expecting a good fight. The line's probably a tad bit high. Briones deserves a little bit more respect than uh, where it's currently at, but at the same time, I'm not going to pick against Sainz here. I think he's got a little bit more left in the tank, and I think he's the better fighter overall. So my pick is Frankie Sainz to beat uh, Henry Briones. Yeah, to me, this just feels like Frankie Saints had a tough go of it facing uh, some top competition in the UFC bantamweight division. And then he pulled off a quality win over a rising prospect in his last fight. And they're like, all right, we'll, we'll give you an easy one. I mean, I'm not trying to talk down on Henry Briones that much, but I mean, he's 37 years old. He's on a three fight losing streak. He's really only had one good moment in the UFC. And that was when he hurt, Cody Garbrandt when he fought him uh, and he didn't even finish him. And then he ended up losing a pretty one-sided decision. It was just one shining moment during that run. So uh, there's really not that much to like about Briones. I mean, he's, he's got a little bit of power, a little bit of boxing ability, and that's about it. Uh, Frankie Sainz has the stand up. He has way better wrestling than Briones and uh, while they're the same age, Saints, I think, is definitely the better athlete and has a little bit more left in the tank. Um, 
I don't expect, you know, either of these guys to ever really become much in the Bantamweight division, but uh, Sainz at least should be able to take away Briona's strength by putting him on the canvas and winning a decision. I think he wears Briona's down. Um, and realistically, the only way for Briona's to win is to crack Sainz while they're standing. And while that's possible, Sainz has shown that his chin can be cracked against uh, some pretty hard hitters. I don't think Sainz is going to just stand there and let Briona's stand and bang. I mean, I expect Sainz to be shooting early and often and dragging this fight to the floor where he should have a big advantage. So my pick is going to be Frankie Sainz. I think he wins at least by decision. Now, moving up to the featherweight division, we have Enrique Barzola, who is 15-3-1, taking on Brandon Davis, who is 9-3. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Barzola opens minus 165, Davis plus 125. Right now, looking over at BetDSI, it's Barzola at minus 190. The comeback on Davis is at plus 150. So, Barzola gets a little bit more action early on. Not really that surprised. I think where it's at now is a little bit more fair, but it wasn't a bad opener um, from the rip because it's going to be a competitive fight. Both these guys bring it. Both these guys are looking to move up the featherweight ladder, and it should be pretty exciting because Davis, man, he pushes a pretty high pace overall. Uh, he has really good striking. He likes to get in those kind of wars. He's well-rounded enough that he's got solid takedown defense to go along with it, has some okay wrestling as well. So he's a pretty complete fighter and a fun fighter to watch, and he's got some momentum on his side right now as well because he's coming up. Off of a pretty solid win for him over uh, Steven Patters- Peterson. Steven Peterson's a really solid fighter as well, so that was a big win, the biggest win of his career, really. So Davis has a little bit of momentum coming into this fight, but unfortunately for him, I think, man, Barzola is one of these guys, um, up and coming fighter that obviously won the Ultimate Fighter, and since then has excelled his game to another level. It's just the hard work that he's put in, um, the improvements that you see fight by fight with Barzola is really special. Really, I mean, he's it's something to definitely keep an eye on and, and see how far this guy can go because really he's a grinder out there. He likes to utilize his wrestling. He pushes a very high pace, but the improvements that I'm talking about the most are really in his striking. I mean, Barzola. Pushes a high enough pace with his hands, always in your face. Um, he's accurate with his punches as well, has some power, has some confidence. And then if he gets you to the ground, he obviously has good ground and pound to go along with it. Now he's starting to have his sub game work for him a little bit better as well. He's just a smart IQ fighter and a high pace fighter that usually has good conditioning to go along with it. So stylistically, it's going to be a tough matchup for Davis. Um, I think Barzola is basically going to be kind of – implementing the same type of stylistic fight that Bokniak did against Davis as well. And he's going to have that same type of success, but magnify that with Barzola's wrestling on top of it all. So just a tough matchup, I think, for Davis here. So I'm going to pick Barzola to win, but it should be exciting. Davis is going to definitely have his moments throughout the fight as well. Um, but I just think Barzola is going to be a little bit too much for him in this one. Davis has exciting combinations and, and he can go, but my main issue with him is he doesn't really have that one punch stopping power and Enrique Barzola is a handful. Uh, Barzola is a guy that uh, has improving stand up. I mean, he's been able to stand and trade with some uh, pretty tough fighters, but where he's absolutely at his strength is mixing things up and dragging fights to the floor, repeatedly putting his opponents on their back. I mean, you go back and watch uh, his last three fights you see seven takedowns against Chris Avila, nine takedowns against Gabriel Benitez, five takedowns against Matt Bissett, wins a unanimous decision all three times. Um, it seems like he's really going back to his roots because he was more of a wrestling focused, and then he added the striking to his game, lost that close decision to Kyle Bokniak, and he's gone back to his roots a little bit with the wrestling. So uh, if he's smart, I think he just drags us to the floor because Davis is... Uh, three inches taller, two inches reach on him. And, you know, Barzola doesn't really want to have to wade through that jab and those combinations to try to land his own shots. And I don't think Barzola really has the power to hurt Davis either. So uh, Barzola, if he's smart, he just waits for Davis to throw a combination, maybe get off balance just a little bit, and then he just shoots in. And I think he should be able to drag this fight to the floor. Uh, Davis has shown okay takedown defense so far, but he's faced two fighters in uh, Bokniak and Peterson that do not have that great of wrestling. I expect Barzola to be able to have success with his wrestling early and often, and he should be able to ride that success to a decision victory at the least. So Barzola is my pick. 
Now moving on to the Fox Sports 2 prelims and sticking in the featherweight division, we have Gabriel Benitez, who is 20 and 7, taking on Humberto Bandene, who is 14 and 4 with one no contest. Now Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? This fight opened exactly a pick, minus 120 either way. And right now looking over at Bet DSI, it's Benitez minus 225, the comeback on Bandonway, Bandone at plus 175. So needless to say, the opener was not at a good spot. Um, and the action came in on Benitez, which is the right way to go, honestly. I mean, he should be a solid favorite in this fight, uh, which he is now. The public obviously out there, you guys that got the early line, um, I think got it going in the right direction for sure. I've been impressed with uh, Bandone for sure. I mean, if you look at it, he's another one of these young guns that's improving all the time. I mean, he's 23 years old. Uh, the guy has some length for the featherweight division. He's got some really – a lot of potential, some real talent on the feet. He's got some real talent on the ground as well, has some underrated wrestling to go along with it. But he's just still raw. He hasn't really fought the best fighters outside of the UFC. Um, his level of competition has been stepping up, but now he's uh, definitely – facing the best fighters he's ever faced. And this is a huge step up in class, I think, in Benitez. I know that, again, Bandone kind of stepped in in his UFC debut on short notice. And, man, he got a, a solid upset win over Bravo. Martin Bravo was a very hyped prospect in his own right. And that knee that he landed, Bandone, is just, was just vicious. Spot on timing. I mean, accurate. There's not much more you could say. That was just a beautiful technique, and that's what he's capable of. But that being said, I think Benitez is just more seasoned. He's ahead of uh, where Benene is right now. Uh, his striking has looked very impressive. In my opinion, Benitez's kryptonite has been guys that have been able to take him down, out wrestle him, and just dominate him on the ground more so than anything else. Um, and Bandone has a little bit of that in him. I think he is going to look to wrestle in this fight um, because if you look back at some of his fights before he got into UFC, um, he has done that. But I think Benitez is going to be seasoned enough that he's going to be able to stuff some of those takedown attempts, keep this fight standing, mix things up well enough, and kind of just outland Bandone way along the way and just kind of outsmart him. And he's like I said, he's a savvy vet. He's really been fighting well in the UFC overall, Benitez has, and uh, he's finally getting the respect he deserves, I think, overall. So I just think Benitez is going to be too much too soon for Bandone, even though I see the potential that the 23-year-old has. I just think this step up is just a little bit too much for him. So my pick is going to be Benitez. I wouldn't be surprised if Benitez stops him, but uh, if it goes to a decision, I think he's going to win two rounds out of three, probably a 29-28 type of decision for Benitez. And I agree. Uh, Bandone is long and tall for the division, which is great. And that's definitely going to make him a threat because uh, there aren't a lot of guys that are six feet tall in the featherweight division. But uh, Gabriel Bonitas is more savvy. He's been around the block against better competition overall. And Benitez has found some success in the UFC. Um, I would say overall, Benitez has the better technical boxing ability. He's the more active striker. Uh, but Bendene can make up for it with his length, with his kicking ability. If he catches Benitez with a head kick, I mean, it's going to be lights out for Benitez, just like it was in uh, Bendene's last bout against the tough Latin America winner. I mean, that was a huge shocker. It was a crazy impressive performance, but it also was something that I think he maybe caught somebody off guard. And I think people know that those head kicks are coming now. So... Uh, Benitez, if he plays it smart, he should be able to get inside Bendene's reach. I don't think that Bendene has developed the use of range and distance, uh, enough that he'll be able to keep Benitez at the end of a jab or anything. So I just think Benitez can outwork Bendene. And as long as he, uh, defends against the head kick, then he should be able to at least win a decision, maybe get a knockout, but that's more unlikely. Uh, but, uh, I do think that Benitez is just the better fighter here, and he should be able to do enough to win over the judges. Now, dropping down to the women's strawweight division, we have Pollyanna Botello, who is five and one, taking on Siori Kondo, who is six and zero. Oh. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Patello open minus 185, the comeback on Condo plus 145. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, it is currently minus 158 for Patello, the comeback on Condo at plus 140. So Lime just have tightened up a little bit, um, and a little bit more actually coming in the dog's way overall, but still, it seems like it was a pretty fair line set at the beginning, and it's gonna 
generate two-way action overall. This should be another competitive fight. I mean, these ladies both like to bring it. Um, I've been impressed with them uh, thus far in their short UFC careers. I mean, both of these ladies have performed relatively well. I mean, Botello in her UFC debut, it was kind of a lackluster performance in some ways because, I mean, Gonzalez wanted to kind of clinch up with her and hold her against the cage and utilize her ground game um, more so than anything. And Botello didn't have that. She, she let her kind of hold her against her cage and control the tempo of that fight somewhat, but Botello didn't let the fight uh, go to the ground at all, which credit to her takedown defense ended up holding up there. And Botello, of course, has more of a striking-based background. Um, she has some heavy punches. I mean, for the ladies' divisions, for sure, a, a lot of times um, women aren't well-known um, in the UFC thus far to finish fights on the feet, but this lady can bring it for sure. She has some punching power, and she's got some accuracy. It's just her activity level needs to, I think, step up a little bit. We want to see her be a little bit more aggressive because I think she'll really do better and open up some eyes. And Kondo could be the fighter that's going to bring that out of her because Kondo is very aggressive. She's the opposite end of that. I mean, she definitely keeps a high pace. Uh, she has really clean striking, good technique. She has a pretty solid ground game. She doesn't utilize it a lot, but that being said, I think in this fight she might try against Botello. I think Botello is going to stuff the takedown zone. Botello is going to be the stronger of the two, and I think Botello is going to be able to kind of control where, the, where this fight goes more so, keep the feet, fight upright. If they're up against a cage, I think Botello is going to be on the outside, so it's going to be Kondo the one that has to kind of push off or whatnot. And I think Botello's clinch game is a little bit better than Kondo's as well. So I think she's going to be landing the harder strikes on the feet. She's going to be controlling the tempo of this fight, and I think she's going to edge out a pretty close decision win. And again, if there's a knockout in this fight, I actually think Botello has more of a chance to do that as well. So uh, for me, I have to side with Botello. I think she's going to look a little bit more impressive in her second UFC fight. She's going to feel a little bit more comfortable. And way, the way Kondo brings a fight to her, I think she's going to have no choice but to open up and put on a pretty good show. So the pick is Botello for me. Uh, Botello was limited in her UFC debut because uh, Pearl Gonzalez was just leaning on her and clinching against the fence for three straight rounds. But she still did manage to outstrike Gonzalez over two to one. Um, Kondo, on the other hand, I mean, she threw 300 strikes in her UFC debut. I mean, she is not afraid to let loose with her hands, which is actually a great thing for Botello because I think it'll force her to engage. And Botello is going to be the bigger fighter, the longer fighter, the more powerful striker. Uh, Kondo might be the more active striker, but um, her accuracy is lower. Um, I, I expect in this fight... Uh, that Botello is going to land some heavy shots. And I think that she's going to be backing off Kondo eventually, uh, because when you're just all offense like Kondo is at times, um, there's going to be openings created against somebody that really knows what they're doing, like Botello. Uh, I'm a big fan of Botello. I think that she's got a ton of talent. And I think this could be the perfect type of fight to showcase that talent, because Kondo is going to pretty much threaten almost zero uh, ground game. And... Unlike in the last fight where Pearl Gonzalez was just desperately trying to clinch and avoid extended stand-up exchanges, this fight should have a ridiculous amount of stand-up exchanges. I expect these girls to be biting down on their mouthpieces and just throwing leather. And Botello should just get the better of it because she's the more technical, powerful striker. I think that she potentially could not just win this fight uh, by decision, I think that she could score a violent knockout at some point. So I, I am a big fan of Pollyanna Botello, and I think this is going to be a great showcase of her talent. Now, moving up to the flyweight division, we have Brandon Moreno, who is 14 and 4, taking on Alexander Pantoja, who is 18 and 3. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Moreno opens minus 170, the comeback on Pantoja at plus 130. Right now looking over at Bet DSI, currently at DSI, it's minus 135 for Pantoja. The comeback of Moreno is at plus 105. So line flipped. That's how much action early on came in on Pantoja. Uh, well, early on, it doesn't take much to move some of those small limits as well. So uh, it, we'll see what's out there. But overall, there's definitely a little bit more action coming in Pantoja's way. And it should be a competitive fight. And I think the early action might end up uh, being the right side of this fight as well. I mean, these guys had a classic battle on the Ultimate Fighter. If you look back, uh, check that out. It's available on UFC Fight Pass um, on their Ultimate Fighter season. So they had a pretty good fight. I mean, it was a scrap in the first round. Pantoja ended up taking over in the second round and uh, got the rear naked choke on the ground, sunk it in there, and uh, Moreno had a tap, had a choice to tap. But it was a war. I mean, these guys were definitely both banging, hurting each other on the feet a little bit. Uh, just... 
a really fun fight to watch, and I'm expecting a similar fight this time. Now, both these guys obviously have gotten better since the show because outside of that, I mean, like I said, I've said it before. I mean, just the Ultimate Fighter experience does wonders for their careers. It's tough to go through what they have to go through on the show, but afterwards, it seems like they pick up a lot of new tools, a lot of good training techniques, just does them a lot of good. So you see a lot of these fighters end up taking their game to another level, and I think both these guys are much better than they were on the show. Moreno has faced some really good competition since the show as well. I mean, both of them have really, but Moreno has been in the spotlight a little bit more. So I guess I understand why he opened the favorite. I mean, he's more of the popular fighter of the two because he has been getting more of the attention. Um, and he's performing relatively well overall, you know, and he's young enough as well that uh, he's going to continue to improve. He's only 24 years old. So sky's the limit for a guy like Moreno, especially with the competition level he's faced us for. But for me, in my opinion, Pantoja is still a little bit ahead of him overall in his career. I think he's the smarter fighter. He's got the higher IQ. I think even if it's going to be close early on, Moreno sometimes tends to be a front runner. He might come out first round, win that round. But as the fight progresses, I think Pantoja is actually going to take over and maybe even repeat his performance on the ultimate fighter, get his back and, and, you know, sink in the choke there. But if not, I think he at least edges Moreno out on the scorecards. So for me, I think it's going to, a good chance we see a repeat and Moreno uh, ends up losing to Pantoja twice. Um, you know, and I think Pantoja is stepping in on short notice. So that's kind of a little bit of a concern for me to see where his cardio is. He's replacing Ray Borg, obviously thoughts and prayers with Ray Borg. Cause he's, you know, his, uh, he has a child right now that's uh, battling through some issues. I'm sure most of you guys know about that, but that's why Borg is out of the fight and uh, Pantoja is stepping in to replace him. So that short notice is definitely a concern a little bit, but I think Pantoja is still going to do well enough in this fight to uh, at least take the scorecards if it goes that round uh, that long. So the pick is Pantoja. And I agree. Uh, Brandon Moreno is an extremely talented fighter and he's actually had more success in the UFC than Pantoja has. But, uh, I still think that Pantoja is probably the better fighter and the better overall prospect. Um, Moreno actually even had better success against a common opponent in Dustin Ortiz. He finished Ortiz, uh, and Pantoja recently lost a decision to him. But even with that, all that being said, I think that Pantoja is a better pure technical striker than Moreno. And as long as Moreno's herky jerky, unorthodox style isn't too much for Pantoja, as long as he can figure it out, he should be able to hang with Moreno on the feet and on the ground. While Moreno has some crafty submissions, uh, Pantoja is definitely the better grappler as well. So if this fight goes to the floor, Pantoja should get the better of him. And while Moreno does have a little bit more power than Pantoja, I think Pantoja is the better technical striker too. So unless Moreno clips Pantoja with something nasty, I think Pantoja um, can repeat history here and, kind of figure out Moreno and then eventually get this fight to the floor where he should at least win a decision, if not potentially submit Moreno again. Uh, I know that Moreno's had some success in the UFC, but I think he's starting to come back to earth a little bit after Sergio Pettis kind of uh, exposed him in one of his last fights. So my pick is going to be Alexander Pantoja. Now moving on to the main event of the preliminary card, we have a welterweight contest between Zach Cummings, who is 21 and 5, and Michelle Prezeris, who is 24 and 2. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Prezeris opened the favorite, minus 155. Cummings opened plus 115 as the underdog. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, it's actually Cummings as a favorite. He's minus 135, and the comeback on Prezeris is at plus 105. So another case where the line did flip, more actually coming in Cummings' way. And it seems to be right as well. I mean, I think Cummings should be the favorite. Now, he's a slight favorite. It's almost a pick-up type of fight. Prezeris, of course, is moving up to the welterweight division. He's moving back up since his actual UFC debut against Paulo Thiago way back when, when he took the fight on short notice, and ended up losing a decision uh, to uh, Tiago back then, but he ended up starting off that fight pretty well, and he didn't seem like he was too... You know, didn't have the short end of the stick on the strength, put it that way for welterweight, but he is too undersized in most cases at welterweight. So that's going to be interesting in this fight because Cummings isn't exactly a small welterweight. So he's going to have a big size advantage over Prezeris. Now, again, Prezeris is a tank. He's a very strong fighter. So I don't think it's going to be too much of a discrepancy overall, but Cummings is going to be long enough to give Prezeris a lot of problems on the feet. And I think he, Cummings is also the type of 
wrestler that's going to give Prezeris a lot of problems as far as takedown ability and takedown defense goes as well. So this should be an interesting fight. Prezeris has gotten better on the feet. Um, he's fast. He's got some power with those punches as well. Um, he's getting more confident. So you cannot take him lightly on the feet. And of course, we all know that on the ground, um, I mean, again, he controls the tempo, but he also can sub you. Um, he has decent ground and pound. So Prezeris is a threat everywhere it goes. But again, I think here size is going to come into play a little bit because I think Cummings, his length and his ability, his technical ability on the feet, he's got some mission game to go along with it. I think everywhere the fight takes place, Cummings is probably going to be giving Prezeris some fits. So it's not going to be a walk in the park for Prezeris. I think it's a good test for him to see where he's at because in my opinion, Cummings is one of the best welterweights on the UFC roster and probably one of the most underrated welterweights on the roster as well with the skill set that he has and, and the really the wins that he's, he's gained. I mean, the only people that have, defeated coming so far in his UFC career um, were Ponzinibbio, which he's obviously in that kind of contender spot at, at welterweight. He's in the mix, at least. And then, of course, Gunnar Nelson, which, in my opinion, is one of the better welterweights as well. So those two losses aren't really that bad. And that fight with Ponzinibbio for Cummings was an absolute war. It was a fun fight to watch. So I think he's going to come show up here. He's been out for almost uh, a year or a little bit over a year, I should say um, with an injury. He's going to come back in here, I think, and uh, he won't have too much rust. I mean, he, he works good at a great camp in Kansas city, of course. And I think they're well prepared. And I think he's going to come in here and uh, knows what he has to do against Prezeris and get the W. So my pick is Cummings, whether it's on the cards or maybe we see Prezeris getting stopped for the first time against Cummings as well. Wouldn't be shocked by that, but I think more so than anything is Cummings uh, getting the nod over Prezeris probably on the cards. And I have to agree. Uh, the main thing here is size. Uh, Michelle Prezeris has had such a big advantage in the lightweight division because he's barely cutting weight or he's missing weight by 5 to 10 pounds and then fighting against lightweights. And while he's not a huge lightweight, he is a big, bulky, strong lightweight. He's not a big, bulky, strong welterweight. He's a stocky welterweight, but, uh, I mean... Zach Cummings is going to have eight inches in reach on him. He's going to be six inches taller. And uh, Cummings is going to have a very good ground game and a decent stand-up to match Prezeris. Uh, Prezeris usually likes to wade forward with heavy strikes. And I just don't see him having that same success uh, against Cummings because Prezeris, like, opens up takedown opportunities by throwing bombs and I don't know if he'll even be able to hit Cummings. So uh, what I expect to happen here is Prezeris is going to be forced to shoot from the outside, and that's going to be significantly less successful, and he'll be doing it against somebody with elite Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills. I don't see Cummings being able to submit Prezeris, but I can see him really making Prezeris work for every takedown that he could get. And that's realistically the only way I see Prezeris winning this fight, is getting takedowns and securing top position and riding out rounds. But uh, Cummings has had historically pretty decent takedown defense. The only guys that have really been able to put him on his back uh, have not been able to keep him there, except for Gunnar Nelson. And I don't think Prezeris is at Gunnar Nelson level of ground game. So uh, I think Cummings can beat Prezeris up on the feet. I think he can hold his own with Prezeris in terms of ground game. And I think he's just going to tire Prezeris out. And over the course of three rounds, I see Prezeris taking a, a beating and realizing that uh, he should learn to cut weight better because he's being punished by being forced to move up to the welterweight division because he couldn't make the lightweight limit. And I think that somebody that's as big and strong as come as Cummings, who has fought for light heavyweight titles in the past, uh, I think he's going to really punish Prezeris and eventually either get a finish or win a decision. So my pick is going to be Zach Cummings. Now, moving on to the Fox Sports 1 main card, we have Vicente Luque, who is 12-6-1 in the welterweight division, taking on Chad LaPreece, who is 14-2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Luke up in minus 285, the comeback on LaPriest at plus 185. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, it is currently Luke at minus 215, the comeback on LaPriest at plus 170. So, action did get bet on uh, LaPriest early on. Line has dropped. Line margins have tightened up a little bit. So, it's not a huge drop on the dog price, though, from plus 185 down to about a buck 70, like I said now. So, nothing 
significant. I mean, just a little bit more action coming in the priest's way. And it might be the right way. You guys all know that have listened to the podcast for a while now, how much of a fan I am of Luque's. I mean, the guy is a very talented fighter. I've told you from the beginning, he's severely underrated. Well, now I think people are starting to wake up on him and, and realize what kind of fighter he really is. And he's such a well-rounded fighter. He's a threat on the feet. He's a threat on the ground as well. He's got underrated wrestling. I mean, he's just a complete fighter. And again, he's only 26 years old with the experience that he's had. I mean, Luque is definitely a solid, solid fighter and a very tough out. But Luque has his issues in his own right. And I think as the fight progresses, sometimes he takes his foot off the gas and his conditioning, I think, could be elevated to another level. I mean, that's kind of hindering him a little bit. I think if he could keep the momentum going like he does typically in the first round, all three rounds or or beyond that, if he's going to end up headlining some cards, I think Luque would be on another level as well. So that's the concern with Luque a little bit. For me, again, he's more of a front runner. And even though he can do well in round two and round three in fights, he's competitive. He's not, it's not like he just stops fighting completely, but um, those are the rounds that his opponents at times could take advantage of, of in a situation. If you can survive that long against a fighter like Luque and LaPriest might be able to do that. I mean, LaPriest, I know he's got issues. He's a bit chinny, um, you know, even though he's only got officially knocked out once, he has been clipped in other fights as well. But offensively, he's very talented. I mean, he's a very smart fighter, has good IQ. He's got good conditioning overall as well. And I think if this fight progresses, it will get tighter as the fight goes. So in round two and round three, I think we can see LaPriest possibly step in here and maybe steal those rounds and take a split decision type of fight here but overall i have to side with luke because he is the more complete the more uh i think overall better fighter and i think luke is more of a threat he cannot get laprice out i mean if there's going to be a ko here i think it's going to be luke getting the ko over laprice i think there's if there's going to be a submission obviously luke is slick enough with his chokes i think he could uh, possibly submit laprice laprice does have some pretty good uh, submission defense though so we got to give him credit there and he's not the easiest guy to take down either his takedown defense is solid so I think this plays out on the feet more so than anything else. But Luque still has those tools in his pocket that he can pull out and possibly catch LaPriest along the way. You never know. He's that talented. So I'm slightly leaning towards Luque. But in my opinion, I wouldn't lay the chalk here. It's another one of those situations where it's dog or pass. And LaPriest could be a sleeper and, and come, could come away with this fight. So looking forward to see how this, this one plays out. But my pick is going to be Luque. And I agree. Uh, Vicente Luque is somebody that I just really respect in the welterweight division. I, I consider him very underrated, a fringe top 15 fighter. Uh, Luque has good power. He has a diverse striking skill set, and he has an elite ground game. So uh, Chad LaPriest is going to have his hands full. The only real advantage I see out of LaPriest is I think he's the more active striker, and I think he has a, a better overall boxing game. But I just don't know if that'll be enough. Uh, Luque is uh, going to hit hard. Uh, LaPriest, we've seen get knocked out before. And I think Luque hits a lot harder than Francisco Trinaldo. And uh, while LaPriest has found some success moving up to the welterweight division, uh, Luque is actually going to be bigger than him. He's going to have uh, an inch in height. He's going to have four inches in reach. So uh, LaPriest, if he's not careful, he's going to be eating jabs. He's going to be eating heavy, straight punches. And if this fight goes to the floor, Luque should have a good enough advantage that he can probably at least ride out top position on the ground, if not potentially find a submission. So I really like Vicente Luque here. The only issue I have is with him potentially getting outworked in a pure boxing match. But he doesn't have to do that if he doesn't want to because of his overall other better skills. So my pick is going to be Luque. Now, dropping down to the flyweight division, we have Veronica Macedo, who is 5-1-1, and one, taking on Andrea KGB Lee, who is 8-2. and two. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Lee open minus 350, Macedo at plus 250. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, it's minus 330 for Lee, and the comeback of Macedo is at plus 260. So again, line margins have tightened up a little bit. And two way actually coming in this fight. Line seems appropriately set. Andrea Lee is definitely the more popular fighter. Good to see her making her UFC debut. I mean, she's been a pretty popular fighter outside of the UFC down for the ladies, you know, divisions for, I think, like I said, some time. 
Uh, and it's because of her skill set. It's because I think what she brings to the table, her personality, her looks, everything. She's kind of the total package and has a ton of potential. Um, and the way she fights, she brings it. I mean, she's aggressive. She has good striking. She could hurt you on the feet. She has a really good clinch game. She's relentless with it. Once she gets you in the clinch, I mean, she's nonstop with uh, trying to, you know, the tie plumb, knees, knees to the body, knees to the head, whatever she can get a hold of. And then on the ground, of course, as well. She has solid wrestling. She's able to get the fight to the floor many times. And then her submission game offensively is pretty solid. Now, defensively, sometimes she still does make some mistakes, and that gets her in spots. She's been uh, finished before. She's lost a decision, getting herself in bad spots as well. So she does need to improve on some of the holes in her game, and I think little by little she's getting there. She's definitely improving, but she still lacks some you know, some discipline in, at times as well, which I guess you could say with all fighters. But here in this matchup with Macedo, I think she is going to be the stronger of the two. I think she's going to be able to push a higher pace overall. And Macedo, I actually was pretty impressed with her UFC debut. I think that, you know, she is dropping down to 125 pounds. She's kind of small for the Bantamweight division, so this weight class is going to fit her a lot better. But she's still going to be the smaller fighter. I mean, Lee's still going to be a little bit bigger than her. She's going to have more reach than her as well. So Macedo, even at 125 pounds, where she should be, She's still going to be outsized by a lot of these chicks, so it's it's going to be interesting to see how she does. Now, Macedo is a pretty good fighter, though, overall. I mean, she's got a Taekwondo background, and she uses that Taekwondo well in the cage. Her kicks, I mean, are fast. They're accurate. They're definitely dangerous. She can end fights with them. She's proven that time and time again. Uh, and then also, she has a grappling background. I mean, so she can beat you on the ground. She, her, she can beat you with her... More so her striking with her kicks than anything else, but still, she has some uh, hands to go along with it. So she's not necessarily an easy fight for Lee. I think she's going to bring it, and Lee, like I said, if she makes a mistake, if this fight goes to the ground and Lee makes a mistake, I wouldn't be surprised Macedo comes away with a submission win as well. But overall, I think Lee, the way they match up here, should probably dictate the pace. Again, be the aggressor here overall. I think Macedo's going to have her moments in this fight, and it should be a fun fight, but it's hard not to pick Lee in this spot. Again, I think she has a lot of potential if the UFC matches her right and she continues to improve, man, I mean, she could be a very popular fighter and we'll see where she goes from there. And potentially, you know, if she takes the right steps and keeps on improving, get a title shot as well at 125 pounds. So we'll see. So the pick is Lee to defeat a very game Macedo. Yeah. Macedo in her UFC debut got completely overwhelmed. She is too small for the Bantamweight division and Ashley Evan Smith just beat the hell out of her over the course of three rounds, eventually getting a third round TKO. And honestly, she's probably too small for the flyweight division, or at least she's going to be a little undersized. Um, she has a, a decent ground game and she does come from a bit of a Taekwondo background. So I expect she'll be game and she's not just going to be completely overwhelmed here, but I mean, she's welcoming a, one of the top uh, flyweights that wasn't already in the UFC in Andrea Lee. Uh, Lee poses a significant threats on the feet. Uh, she is active. She's a talented striker. She's aggressive. Uh, I think that Lee is just going to get right in Macedo's face. And as long as she can keep that distance closed, then Macedo really won't have much opportunity to land some of those uh, Taekwondo kicks that she likes to throw. And uh, overall, I mean, Andrea KGB Lee, she's had success in multiple organizations, but most recently uh, in Invicta. I think uh, Lee is uh, someone that could be instantly jump into uh, the top contenders in the the women's flyweight division. I think that she's better than most of the women that were competing on the tough women's flyweight uh, season. And um, while she doesn't really have a lot of significant victories, she does have some, some wins over some of those uh, tough uh, fighters. I mean, she beat Rachel Ostevich. She beat Ariel Beck. Uh, I mean, really, her only uh, loss to anybody in the current UFC women's flyweight division is a split decision to Roxanne Mataferi. And that was a while ago. So I think that, uh, Andrea Lee is going to be, uh, making a big statement here in her UFC debut. I think that she's going to look great. And I expect that she probably can finish Veronica Macedo if, uh, she's aggressive enough and lands good enough strikes on the inside. So my pick is going to be Andrea Lee. Now, moving up to the Bantamweight division, we have Diego Rivas, who is 7-1, and one, taking on Guido Canetti, who is 7-3. and three. 
Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Rivas open minus 160, Canadi at plus 120. Right now looking over at BetDSI, it's Rivas minus 165, the comeback in Canadi plus 135. So solid, solid opener here in this fight. And there is two action coming in this fight as well. It will bounce back and forth a little bit. Rivas would be the more popular pick for sure from the public overall. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that line continue to climb a little bit or climb back as we get closer to fight time. Canetti is just, Honestly, he's one of those guys that doesn't get a ton of respect, but he's a pretty good fighter. And he's 38 years old. I think that could be one reason in the back of my mind. I can't get over that as well. But if you look at some of his last few performances, I mean, Kennedy has actually done relatively well. Now, the problem is he'll be doing well. And then, like, in his last fight against Kang, ended up getting choked out um, by the end of the round. He was winning that round. If that fight ended up going to the scorecards, or at least the round one getting scored, Kennedy probably would have came away with the round one um, nod from the judges. So, he, And that's pretty good, because Kang's a solid fighter. And then, of course, before that, though, uh, he had a, a pretty solid performance against Hugo Viana. Um, now, of course, we know Viana kind of was a little bit overhyped. We gave him too much credit, so I don't know how good that win was, but at the time, it seemed like it was a pretty solid win. And But Kennedy, in those fights, has displayed some real solid potential. I mean, the guy's fast on the feet, he's accurate he has some good stand-up overall um good movement he's got some underrated wrestling he's got a quick shot um on the ground offensively he could do some damage ground and pound he has okay sub game to go along with it it's just Kennedy does make those mistakes from time to time i was just talking about andrew lee kind of having a brain lapse from time to time and, and making a mistake and maybe getting beat in a fight Kennedy is kind of that way especially on the ground as well he will make mistakes now again he's getting to be a bit chinny in his day as well because he's 38 and that's not going to end up getting you know any better at all with uh, as he progresses his career and gets uh, continues to get clipped or whatnot? I don't expect it to improve. So you got to be concerned with Kennedy's chin. And like I said, overall, you know he's a 38 year old fighter that's fighting in against a 26 year old young gun that the UFC is probably trying to promote ahead of Kennedy here. So he's going to have a fight in his hands. But overall, I think he's actually ahead of Revis as far as a complete game. I think he's got better wrestling. He's got a little bit better striking. I should say he pushes the pace a little bit more and is a little bit more aggressive than Revis at times. So he has a lot of good things going for him in this fight. And if he does not get finished, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up winning this fight on the scorecards. But Revis, on the other hand, he's one of these guys I just mentioned, 26 years old. He is improving fight by fight. Um, I believe he's training with Timo Yama right now. Um, and he's been there for a few fights now. So I think the more time he spends in a good solid camp like that, the better he's going to get. So we'll see how what level he has gained or what improvements he's made since his last fight. I think on the feet, he has some power. He has some accuracy. He definitely has some potential. He mixes things up well. He's got some wrestling. His takedown defense lacks a little bit. He needs to improve in that area, but I think he is going to get better. Um, so overall, he's a pretty complete fighter as well. I just think here he's going to have to be the bully. He's going to have to be the aggressor. He's going to have to hurt Kennedy on the feet to kind of at least wake him up and, and get that respect factor and, and then get confidence and, and kind of uh, try to finish uh, Kennedy from there. Because like I said, if it goes to scorecards, I think Kennedy might be the one getting more top position on the ground. I think Kennedy might be the one kind of winning the points battle overall against Revis as well. So to me, this is a tough fight. I kind of been going back and forth overall. Um, I'm going to slightly side with Revis right now because, again, the young gun factor, I think he's going to be the one making more improvements at a higher pace. But, uh, you know, I, I could change my mind and tempted to pick the other way as well because I think, again, Kennedy is the more complete fighter overall. So, as always, for those of you guys that don't know, um, our final picks get ended up uh, getting posted on MMAOddsBreaker.com on fight day with our staff picks article. So if I do change my mind, it'll be posted there. So check that out to make sure. But for right now, I'm going to lean with Revis. Again, I just trust him a, a little bit more, but I think it's going to be a war. And if it does hit the scorecards, I could see it going the other way for sure. So be cautious out there if you're betting this fight. It's not an easy one. Yeah, the way this fight plays out, Kennedy is the better overall fighter. He has more skills. I think that he's... Uh, a little bit more technical of a striker. I think Kennedy is the better ground fighter, but what he has going against him is he's not as quick. He's not as athletic. He's clearly doesn't have the same chin as Rivas. And I don't think that his conditioning is going to be that great in this fight either. So there's a lot of things going against Kennedy as well. Um, Rivas is the only fighter that's actually from Chile for his native country that's competing on this card. So you would think that the UFC wants him to have a, a shining moment for uh, the hometown fans, but Kennedy is definitely going to present some, some problems. Um, Kennedy in his 
last fight, I mean, he was taking the fight to Kang, and then he ended up getting caught in a submission. So I expect that he'll be aggressive early, but if Rivas catches him, it's going to be night-night. I mean, Kennedy got blasted in his UFC debut in a fight that he should have won, and that after he was able to get a win, he didn't fight for a couple years, and that's just not something that's best for your uh, long-term fighting health when you're already late in your fighting career. So I think Diego Rivas at some point clips Kennedy and finishes him. Uh, Kennedy is the better overall fighter, so be wary about that. But uh, just the fact that Kennedy doesn't have a good chin and doesn't have amazing conditioning and uh, the fact that Rivas does have that fight-stopping power like he did, like he used against Noed Lahat, I think that Rivas can find Kennedy's button and put him out. So my pick is going to be Diego Rivas. Now, moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Jared Cannonier, who is 10 and 3, taking on Dominic Reyes, who is 8 and 0. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Reyes open minus 210, Cannonier plus 160. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI is currently Reyes minus 250, the comeback on Cannonier plus 200. So a little bit more action coming in Reyes' way. A two, two and a half to one seems like it's a, a fairly solid line where it is right now as well. And this should be a good fight. I mean, Cannoneer, in my opinion, was definitely doing some really good things I mean, since he dropped down, you know, and, and started fighting at light heavyweight. I, I think he made his UFC debut, of course, why I'm saying that at heavyweight. And then he's dropped down and he's looked pretty good overall. I know he lost a Glover. Um, and most of that fight he lost because he was getting taken down and Glover was having his way with him on the ground. But overall, Cannoneer, is a pretty dangerous fighter on the feet, and he's proven that time and time again as well. I mean, he's, he pushes a high pace. He, he stalks forward. He, he waits. He's patient enough that he picks his spots, and then once he lets go of his hands, I mean, there's definitely some power behind him, and he's a threat on the feet for sure. So Reyes is more known for his striking ability as well. Now, he is a pretty complete fighter, but a lot of us know him from his highlight reel-type knockouts, from his devastating kicks that he throws, and just from his clinch work. I mean, Reyes has a heck of a Muay Thai clinch. I mean, it's it's really nice – uh, to watch because, I mean, he's just so accurate from that tie plum and vicious as well. So Rias has a lot of ability on the feet as well. So if this fight plays out on the feet, it's going to be interesting because both these guys like to stand and bang. Obviously, Rias is a little bit more talented, and I think he's got more of a mixed bag in his you know, in his tools that he can pull out and be more dangerous and more effective with. Whereas Cannoneer, I think, could be more effective maybe with his pure boxing. Rias could be more effective, I mean, just mixing things up probably with his kicks and his knees more so than anything else. Now, the wild card here is Rias's wrestling and his submission ability. I think that he's able to get the fight to the floor and utilize some okay wrestling. Rias needs to improve on that wrestling a little bit more, but he has shown the ability to take the fight to the ground at times when he wants to. And then on the ground, he is going to be the better jujitsu practitioner as well. Now, that being said, Glover Teixeira was not able to submit a guy like Cannoneer. So I think Rias is going to make it interesting on the ground. I don't know if he's going to be able to submit him because if a guy like Glover doesn't submit him, that tells me that you're, Sub defense is pretty good, especially as, as much time as they spend on the ground in that fight. So Rice is going to be looking for some ground to pound. He's going to be looking to finish the fight on the floor if he doesn't choose to stand up and try to play that game a little bit because he can have success there as well. So he is a solid favorite for a reason. He's the up and coming young gun as well. I mean, he's a younger fighter. He's going to get more respect. He's look, he's a flashier fighter. He's a highlight type of real fighter. So I am going to side with Rice. Uh, but where it's at now, be cautious because Cannonier with one punch could change things quickly. So I think it's at a solid spot where it's about two and a half to one, probably enough to keep most away because you got to respect Cannonier just enough. But hopefully, in my opinion, Dominic Reyes has a lot of potential and he can climb up that ladder if they match, continue to match him right. Hopefully, he gets another solid win here and he continues to look good because I like to see him kind of fight the top tier fighters, the top 10 guys, um, or more so the top five guys to see what he, he's able to do in the light heavyweight division because the UFC badly needs more light heavyweights to step up and be, you know, kind of make this division deeper and be more threats for, uh, you know, possible title contention as well. So Dominic Reyes has some interesting tools, and let's see where he goes with this. So my pick is Reyes to probably finish Cannoneer along the way. Yeah, Jared Cannoneer is an exciting fighter to watch when he's allowed to stand and trade with somebody, but uh, he also has had his issues there. I mean, he did get knocked out violently in his UFC debut, and then he's had issues with people that can take him down and keep him down because he doesn't have very good takedown defense. 
honestly, he's got some of the worst takedown defense of any fighters in, above the middleweight division at 27%. Um, Dominic Reyes uh, entered the UFC on a massive hot streak, just knocking people out left and right in the first round. And he's continued that while... Uh, he hasn't quite been as impressive as I was expecting. I mean, he still has picked up uh, first-round finishes against uh, Joaquin Christensen and Jeremy Kimball in his first two UFC fights, uh, one by knockout, one by submission. Now, against Cannoneer, uh, Reyes is going to have equal reach, but Cannoneer, I think, can step in and out of range a little bit quicker and land those nasty shots. But uh, Reyes... With uh, the five-inch reach advantage, as long as he can kind of fight tall and long, I think that he can keep Cannoneer at the end of his punches because uh, Cannoneer is a guy that likes to throw in combination and shoot in with that one big shot. But uh, Reyes, it feels like when he lands the big shot, I mean, it can do a little bit more damage. And he has historically been able to put away uh, more people early. Um Reyes also definitely has a, a decent ground game. I mean, he's finished a quarter of his fights by submission. So if Cannoneer, uh, if, if the standup is going, not going Reyes's way, or even if it's, uh, even, then Reyes might be able to take this fight to the floor. Um, he has had 100% takedown accuracy so far, granted against lower tier competition, but he should be able to put Cannoneer on his back if he wants to. So I think Reyes can hold his own, if not get the better of Cannoneer on the feet. And then if that isn't working for him, he should be able to get it to the floor. So I think with his well-roundedness, uh, I have to side with Reyes. Now, moving on to the co-main event of the evening, we have a women's strawweight bout between Alexa Grasso, who is 10-1, and and Tatiana Suarez, who is 6-0. and Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? This fight opened to pick them, minus 110, minus 120 either way. And right now it's all the way up to Suarez, minus 700 at Bet DSI, the comeback at plus 500. So I, I believe out there it says it opened at minus 300. Um, but again, I think it did open actually a pick them type of fight. The betting action actually took it up to minus 300 before it got posted on some spots. They kind of show the opening line. So Yes, it was open to pick them, and that's how much action came in on Suarez. And I think for a good reason overall. I mean, obviously, Suarez, for those people that came in and bet the fight, they know what she's about. and She's one of the best wrestlers at 115 pounds. I mean, in my opinion, I'm just going to get it out there early on. I mean, she's a future champion at 115 pounds. With what she brings to the table, she's going to be a fit for a lot of these girls. I mean, they just can't sustain the the level of, of wrestling and ground and grappling and the the pace that Suarez is going to end up putting on people and Grasso is going to fall victim to this as well. Grasso is a very popular fighter. So I guess I understand, you know, as far as popularity goes, Grasso is definitely more in the public eye. She's been around the sport for a while. She's been the one that's been getting more attention and more hype amongst the MMA community. So I get it. She is a very popular fighter, but as far as skill set goes, I mean, Suarez is going to take her down. She's going to dominate this fight on the ground. And if she doesn't stop Grasso, she's going to at least, just come away with another decisive, decisive victory like she had in her last fight as well. So, I mean, in most cases, Suarez gets dominant position. She's able to stop you with ground and pound or, you know, finish you by submission as well. I mean, that's the type of fighter she is. But in her last fight, Pereira was able to hold, hold, hang in there, really. I mean, I'm surprised that she did, but she did. She hung in there enough. But, I mean, Suarez just dominated her. It wasn't even a close fight because of the, you know, how much – control and you know where she was able to dictate the fight and, and just have her way with her so Suarez is that good and Pereira is not an easy fight and not an easy out at 115 pounds either so that tells you what kind of level Suarez is at so unfortunately for Grasso I think she needs to keep this fight upright to have a shot um, her stand-up's not bad she's proven that time and time again but she's been taken down too many times in her fights for me to have faith in her I mean Marcos was able to get her down a couple times Herrig was able to get her down a couple times as well so if, if those ladies were able to get this fight to the ground I have no doubt that Suarez will be able to get this fight to the ground and that's going to be a nightmare for Grasso when it happens so I understand all the early action where why it came in and, you know, where it pushed the line to. I'm surprised that it got kind of this high, honestly, but at the same time, I'm not going to pick against Suarez here. I think she does win this fight. So where it is now, I would not recommend touching this fight, betting Suarez, stay away from it. You never know. I mean, Grasso isn't exactly a can type of fighter, but again, styles make fights and stylistically, this is a nightmare matchup for Grasso. So I'm picking Suarez to win. 
in my opinion, the only thing that has kept Tatiana Suarez from being a top five title contender in the women's strawweight division has been inactivity. I mean, she won the Ultimate Fighter back in July of 2016. She didn't fight for over a year until this past November um, when she won against Pereira. And then this is her next fight. So this is just her third fight in the UFC. But I believe that she has the skill set to be a champion. Absolutely. She has the best wrestling of any women on the roster. That includes uh, Olympic silver medalist Sarah McMahon. I think Suarez's MMA wrestling is absolutely unstoppable. Um, she is tenacious with those takedowns and she has stifling top control. Um, I mean, she is a fighter that I don't think anybody wants to fight right now. So I have major props to Alexa Grasso for taking this fight, especially because Suarez is actually ranked, uh, lower than her. Um, this is a, a better opportunity for Suarez, but, um, Alexa Grasso, I expect to be put on her back repeatedly here. And unless she can latch onto something, she is going to be going for a ride and staying there and either losing a decision or potentially getting submitted or grounded and pounded to a, a stoppage victory. Uh, Grasso just doesn't have the power to hurt Suarez on the feet while during those brief moments that there is stand up. Uh, Suarez on the feet really isn't anything special, but who cares? She's going to get this fight to the floor. She has 87% takedown accuracy, and that number might be going up after this fight, even though Grasso is a talented uh, top 15 fighter. I just think Suarez is that good, and I have no problem with how this line has gone because uh, Suarez looks like uh, a serious contender and a player in the 115-pound division. So I think Suarez rolls, and I just don't think that Grasso has the weapons to threaten her here. So Suarez is definitely my pick. Now moving up to the 170-pound division for the main event of the evening, we have Damian Maya, who is 25 and 8, taking on Kamaro Usman, who is 11 and 1. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Usman opened minus 175 to come back on Maya plus 135. Another spot where the line skyrocketed right now. Over at BetDSI, it's minus 655. The comeback on Maya is at plus 465. And I should mention out there, there are some sports books that have minus 800 Usman, uh, minus 700 Usman. I'm seeing minus 900 in Vegas. So just, I mean, this fight is basically between six and a half to one to nine to one. And so you're seeing a, a ridiculous number against a very, very talented fighter in Maya who just recently fought for the title. So that tells you the level of respect that Usman's getting here and kind of rightfully so. I hate to say it, but uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing a 40 year old Damian Maya and I've been a, a big fan of his. I've been a supporter of him. The guy's made me some cash pulling off some upsets along the way as well. And again, if you guys have been listening to the show, well, you know that he's come through for us and other times he's per- overperformed in, in great fights as well, where he came close and, you know, and did better than most people thought. Now against a guy like Woodley, you know, it, it kind of, he kind of got exposed again, 40 years old though. I mean, you got to give the guy a lot of credit for going five rounds with a guy that can stuff your takedowns and beat you up on the feet. And that's kind of the blueprint that Usman's going to have to follow here. Same thing with Covington in his last fight. Although Maya did have some su- success on the feet against Covington. So credit to him there. I don't think he's going to have as much success against Usman on the feet as he did Covington there. So, but the blueprint is there. That's why you're seeing such a huge discrepancy in, in line. I mean, with a, a big, chalk move with everybody kind of laying that price on Usman and not hesitating at all because Usman really has a path to victory. He can follow the blueprint that Covington set, the, that Woodley set before him. I think that, again, he's going to have a little bit more success than Covington did on the feed. I think he can end up uh, doing some damage and possibly finishing Maya because Maya is stepping in here, fighting, taking the fight on short notice. This is a five-round fight, of course. Maya does tend to slow down as the fight goes on, especially in the championship rounds in round four, round five. Uh, Maya's a warrior, though. He's not going to give up. He's going to be a hard guy to finish but if anybody could do it it could be a guy like Usman I mean he has that kind of power and he has that kind of ability and he's got that kind of confidence right now as well so the wrestling background of Usman he's going to have to use it in reverse keep this feet upright keep this fight upright excuse me keep it on the feet have success and try to outpoint Maya if not finish him along the way I think Usman will do try to do that now the only concern here especially at the price if you're going to be laying six seven eight to one all it takes is one mistake from Usman to get beaten in this fight because Damian Maya has a slick way of taking his back. Even if he doesn't get the fight to the floor, he likes to use the cage and kind of sneak up his opponent's back that way. And once he gets on your back, I mean, you got to fight it off. 
and it's not going to be an easy thing to do. So all it takes is one mistake at that price to uh, for Damian Maya to cash as an underdog. I'm not recommending people go out there and bet him, but I'm saying if you're going to lay that kind of chalk or, or think that Usman is a sure thing and put him in parlays, I would probably rethink that and, and maybe stay away from it at this point because the line is kind of ridiculous. I mean, more so than not, I would sit back and watch this fight and see how it plays out because you have a young gun. Like I said, Usman, he's only 31 years old. Stylistically, it should be a fight he could keep upright and fight smart enough to get the W here against Damian Maya. So the pick is Usman. I mean, no surprise there. He is a huge favorite for a reason. Uh, but part of me is honestly, as always, going to be pulling for Damian Maya. I would love to see him, um, you know, get that submission win or you know pull off a huge upset win of, of course as well because Maya deserves it his whole career has been pretty solid he's been kind of underrated throughout and he's just a tremendous fighter so he's a warrior I'd like to see him get the W but unfortunately for him I think Usman is going to be a little too much for him and I agree uh Kamara Usman is a guy that is absolutely soaring up the rankings in the welterweight division and he's having trouble finding fights and Props to Damian Maya for stepping in for Ponzinibbio after Ponzinibbio's injury uh, and keeping a, a decent main event here for the debut in Chile. But I just think that we're going to see a repeat here of what Colby Covington did to Damian Maya. Uh, Covington was also an accomplished wrestler that isn't that much of a striker, but Damian Maya is really not much of a striker either. And Covington was just aggressive, got in Maya's face and just outworked him over the course of three rounds. Maya actually had some success against Covington early, but he just tired out. I mean, striking is not his forte, and uh, Maya has had a history of conditioning issues. Uh, it's, it can be exhausting trying to, to get takedowns and uh, to strike when you're not used to standing and trading for most of your fights. So against somebody like Usman, who has elite athleticism and takedown ability, but also that explosive power on the feet, I think Maya's really going to be in trouble here. I mean, unless Maya can somehow get on Usman's back and work for a submission, um, I think at some point Usman uh, just punishes Maya on the feet. Uh, while Usman doesn't have the best technique, he does have good power and a good pace, and he should be able to land some significant strikes against Maya over the course of three rounds, five rounds actually. So with this being a five-round fight, I'm actually even more worried about Maya because of his uh, conditioning issues. So I think uh, at some point, Usman wears Maya down and probably finishes him on the feet. And I think that if he uh, mixes things up to the head and body, they're gonna she's going to find some openings. And unlike Tyron Woodley, who played it extremely cautious against Maya, I think Usman is going to be aggressive and he will uh, benefit from that. And I expect that he does get a finish at some point against Damian Maya. So Usman is definitely going to be my pick. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC Fight Night 129. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to BetDSI. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.